Hello and welcome to our listeners across the world. I hope you're well, staying strong and fighting back. This is a Workers' Solidarity Movement podcast. Free thinking for free people. Today we're thinking about civilization and primitivism. The WSM is an anarchist organization active on the island of Ireland. If you live on the island of Ireland and want to work with us, or just want to stay up to date, register as an email contact at www.wsm.ie forward slash user forward slash register. This is a reading of a pair of opinion pieces by WSM member Andrew Flood, written in 2004-2005, Civilization, Primitivism and Anarchism, and Is Primitivism Realistic? An anarchist reply to John Zerzan and others. You can find the links to the text versions below, where you can see all the references. So with that out of the way, let's get stuck in. Civilization, Primitivism and Anarchism Over the last decade, a generalised critique of civilization has been made by a number of authors, mostly based in the USA. Some of these have chosen to identify as anarchists, although the more general self-identification is primitivist. Their overall argument is that civilization itself is the problem that results in our failure to live rewarding lives. The struggle for change is thus a struggle against civilization and for an earth where technology has been eliminated. This is an interesting argument that has some merits as an intellectual exercise. But the problem is that some of its adherents have used primitivism as a base from which to attack all other proposals for changing society. Facing this challenge, anarchists need to first look to see if primitivism offers any sort of realistic alternative to the world as it is. Our starting point is that the expression, life is hard, can always receive the reply that it is better than the alternative. This provides a good general test of all critiques of the world as it is, including anarchism, which is to ask if a better alternative is possible. Even if we can't point to the better alternative, critiques of the world as it is can have a certain intellectual value. But after the disaster of the 20th century, when so-called alternatives like Leninism created long-lasting dictatorships that killed millions, the question, is your alternative any better than what exists, has to be put to anyone advocating change. The primitivist critique of anarchism is based around the claim to have discovered a contradiction between liberty and mass society. In other words, they see it as impossible for any society that involves groups much larger than a village to be a free society. If this was true, it would make the anarchist proposal of a world of free federations of towns, cities and countryside impossible. Such federations and population centres are obviously a form of mass society or civilization. However, the anarchist movement has been answering this very so-called contradiction since its origins. Back in the 19th century, liberal defenders of the state pointed to such a contradiction in order to justify the need for one set of men to rule over another. Michael Bakunin answered this in 1871 in his essay on the Paris Commune and the idea of the state. Quote, It is said that the harmony and universal solidarity of individuals with society can never be attained in practice because their interests, being antagonistic, can never be reconciled. To this objection, I reply that if these interests have never as yet come to mutual accord, it was because the state has sacrificed the interests of the majority for the benefit of a privileged minority. This is why this famous incompatibility, this conflict of personal interests with those of society, is nothing but a fraud, a political lie, born of the theological lie which invented the doctrine of original sin in order to dishonour man and destroy his self-respect. We are convinced that all of the wealth of man's intellectual, moral and material development, as well as his apparent independence, is the product of his life in society. Outside society, not only would he not be a free man, he would not even become genuinely human, a being conscious of himself, the only being who thinks and speaks. Only the combination of intelligence and collective labour was able to force man out of that savage and brutish state which constituted his original nature, or rather the starting point for his further development. We are profoundly convinced that the entire life of men, their interests, 
tendencies, needs, illusions, even stupidities, as well as every bit of violence, injustice and seemingly voluntary activity, merely represent the result of inevitable societal forces. People cannot reject the idea of mutual independence, nor can they deny the reciprocal influence and uniformity exhibiting the manifestations of external nature. What level of technology? Most primitivists evade the question of what level of technology they wish to return to by hiding behind the claim that they are not arguing for a return to anything. On the contrary, they want to go forward. With that in mind, a reasonable summary of their position is that certain technologies are acceptable up to the level of small village society sustained by hunting, hunting and gathering. The problems for primitivists start with the development of agriculture and mass society. Of course, civilization is a rather general term, as is technology. Few of these primitivists have taken this argument to its logical conclusion. One who has is John Zerzan, who identifies the root of the problem in the evolution of language and abstract thought. This is a logical endpoint for the primitivist rejection of mass society. For the purposes of this article, I'm taking as a starting point that the form of future society that primitivists argue for would be broadly similar in technological terms to that which existed 12,000 years ago on Earth, at the dawn of the agricultural revolution. By this I do not claim that they want to go back, something that is in any case impossible, but rather that if you seek to go forward by getting rid of all the technology of the agricultural revolution and beyond, what results will look quite like pre-agricultural societies of 10,000 BC. As this is the only example we have of such a society in operation, it seems reasonable to use it to evaluate the primitivist claims. A question of numbers. Hunter-gatherers live off the food they can hunt or gather, hence the name. Animals can be hunted or trapped, while fruits, nuts, greens and roots are gathered. Before about 12,000 years ago, every human on the planet lived as a hunter-gatherer. Today, only a tiny number of people do, in isolated and marginal regions of the planet, including deserts, arctic tundra and jungle. Some of these groups, like the Acre, have only had contact with the rest of the planet in recent decades. Others, like the Inuit, have had contact for long periods of time, and so have adopted technologies beyond those developed locally. These latter groups are very much part of the global civilization, and have contributed to the development of new technologies in this civilization. In marginal ecosystems, hunter-gathering often represents the only feasible way of producing food. The desert is too dry for sustained agriculture, and the Arctic is too cold. The only other possibility is pastoralism, the reliance on semi-domesticated animals as a source of food. For example, in the Scandinavian Arctic, the Sami control the movement of huge reindeer herds to provide a regular food source. Hunter-gatherers survive on the food they hunt and gather. This requires very low population densities, as population growth is limited by the need to avoid overhunting. Too much gathering of food and plants can also serve to reduce the number of plants that are available in the future. This is the core problem with the primitivist idea that the whole planet could live as hunter-gatherers. There is not nearly enough food produced in natural ecosystems for even a fraction of the current population of the world to do so. It should be obvious that the amount of calories available to humans as food in an acre of oak forest will be a lot lower than the amount of calories available to humans in an acre of corn. Agriculture provides far, far more useful calories per acre than hunter-gathering in the same acre would. That is because we have spent 12,000 years selecting plants and improving agricultural methods so that per acre we cram in lots of productive plants that put their energies into producing plant parts that are food for us rather than plant parts that are not food for us. Compare any cultivated grain with its wild relative and you will see an illustration of this. The cultivated form will have much bigger grains and a much larger proportion of grain to stalk and foliage. We have chosen plants that produce a high ratio of edible biomass. In other words, a pine tree may be as good or better than a lettuce at capturing the solar energy that falls on it. But with the lettuce, a huge percentage of the captured energy goes into food, around 75%. With the pine tree, none of the energy produces food we can eat. Compare the amount of food to be found in a nearby woodland, 
with the amount you can grow in a couple of square meters of garden cultivated in even an organic low energy fashion. And you'll see why agriculture is a must have for the population on the planet. An acre of organically grown potato can yield 15,000 pounds of food. A square that is 70 yards wide and 70 yards long measures just over an acre. The estimated population of humans on the earth before the advent of agriculture in 10,000 BC varies with some estimates as low as 250,000. Other estimates for the pre-agriculture hunter-gatherer population are more generous, in the range of 6 to 10 million. The earth's current population is nearing 6,000 million. Just a note from the narrator to bear in mind that this was written around 2004. This 6,000 million are almost all supported by agriculture. They could not be supported by hunter-gathering. Indeed, it is suggested that even the 10 million hunter-gatherers who may have existed before agriculture may have been a non-sustainable number. Evidence for this can be seen in the Pleistocene Overkill a period from 12,000 to 10,000 BC, in which 200 genera of large mammals went extinct. In the Americas in this period, over 80% of the population of large mammals became extinct. That this was due to overhunting is one controversial hypothesis. If correct, then the advent of agriculture and civilization may even have then been due to the absence of large game which forced hunter-gatherers to settle down and find other ways of obtaining food. Certainly in recorded history, the same overhunting has been observed with the arrival of man on isolated Polynesian islands. Overhunting caused the extinction of the dodo in Mauritania and the moa in New Zealand, not to mention many less famous species. Living in the bog in winter Another way of looking at the fact that primitivism cannot support all of the people of the planet is more anecdotal and uses Ireland, where I live, as an example. Left to itself, the Irish countryside was, would consist mostly of mature oak forest with some hazel scrub and bogs. Go into an oak forest and see how much food you can gather. If you know your stuff, there is some. Acorns, fruit on brambles and clearings, some wild garlic, strawberries, edible fungi, wild honey, and the meat from animals like deer, squirrel, wild goats, and pigeons that could be hunted. But this is many, many, many fewer calories than the same area cultivated as wheat or potatoes would yield. There is simply not enough land in Ireland to support 5 million, the current population of the island, as hunter-gatherers. Typically, hunter-gatherers live at a population density of 1 per 10 square kilometres. Ireland's present population density is around 500 per 10 square kilometres, or 500 times this. By extending this standard calculation from elsewhere on the planet, the number that could be supported in Ireland would be less than 70,000. Probably a lot less, as only 20% of Ireland is arable land. Blanket bog, or burned karst, provide little in the way of food useful for humans. In winter, there will be very little food to be gathered perhaps small caches of nuts hidden by squirrels and some wild honey. And that even 70,000 people living off hunting would eradicate the large mammals, deer, wild goats, very quickly. The coastal areas and larger rivers and lakes would be the main source of hunting and some gathering in the form of shellfish and edible seaweed. But being generous and assuming that somehow Ireland could sustain 70,000 hunter-gatherers, we discover we need to reduce the population by some 4,930,000, or 98.6%. The actual archaeological estimates for the population of Ireland before the arrival of agriculture is around 7,000 people. The idea that a certain amount of land can support a certain amount of people according to how it is, or in this case is not, cultivated, is referred to as its carrying capacity. This can be estimated for the Earth as a whole. One modern calculation for hunter-gatherers actually give you 100 million as the maximum figure. But just how much of a maximum this is becomes clear when you realise that using similar methods gives 30 billion as the maximum farming figure. That would be six times the world's current population.
but let's take this figure of 100 million as the maximum rather than the historical maximum of 10 million. This is a generous estimate, well above that of those primitivists who have dared to address this issue. For instance, Miss Anthropy, writing in the US Earth First magazine, estimated, quote, Ecotopia would be a planet with about 50 million people who are hunting and gathering for subsistence. The Earth's population today is around 6,000 million. A return to a primitive Earth, therefore, requires that some 5,900 million people disappear. Something has to happen to 98% of the world's population in order for the 100 million survivors to have even the slightest hope of sustainable primitive utopia. Dirty Tricks At this point, some primitivist writers like John Moore cry foul, dismissing the suggestion, quote, that the population levels envisaged by anarcho-primitivists would have to be achieved by mass die-offs or Nazi-style death camps. These are just smear tactics. The commitment of anarcho-primitivists to the abolition of all power relations, including the state with all its administrative and military apparatus, and any kind of party or organisation, means that such orchestrated slaughter remains an impossibility as well as just plain horrendous." End quote. The problem for John is that these smear tactics are based not only on the logical requirements of a primitivist world, but are also explicitly acknowledged by other primitivists. Misanthropy's 50 million has already been quoted. Another primitivist FAQ claims, quote, Drastic population reductions are going to happen whether we do it voluntarily or not. It would be better, for obvious reasons, to do all this gradually and voluntarily. But if we don't, the human population is going to be cut anyway. The Coalition Against Civilization write, quote, We need to be realistic about what would happen were we to enter a post-civilized world. One basic write-off is that a lot of people would die upon civil collapse. While being a hard thing to argue to a moralistic person, we shouldn't pretend this wouldn't be the case. More recently, Derek Jensen, in an interview from issue 6 of the A Word magazine, said, Civilization, quote, needs to be actively fought against, but I don't think that we can bring it down. What we can do is assist the natural world to bring it down. I want civilization brought down, and I want it brought down now. End quote. We have seen above what the consequences of bringing down civilization are. In short, there is no shortage of primitivists who recognise that the primitive world they desire would require mass die-offs. I have not come across any who advocate Nazi-style death camps, but perhaps John just threw this in to muddy the water. Primitivists like John Moore can therefore refuse to confront this question of die-offs by upping the emotional ante and by accusing those who pointed the need for die-offs out as carrying out smear tactics. It's up to him to either explain how 6 billion can be fed, or to admit that primitivism is no more than an intellectual mind game. My expectation is that just about everyone when confronted with this requirement of mass death will conclude that primitivism offers nothing to fight for. A very few, like the survivalists confronted by the threat of nuclear war in the 1980s, might conclude that all of this is inevitable and start planning how their loved ones will survive when others die. But this latter group has moved far, far beyond any understanding of anarchism as I understand it. So the anarcho prefix such primitivists tried to claim has to be rejected. Most primitivists run away from the requirement for mass death in one of two ways. The more cuddly ones decide that primitivism is not a program for a different way of running the world. Rather, it exists as a critique of civilization and not an alternative to it. This is fair enough and there is value in re-examining the basic assumptions of civilization. But in that case, primitivism is no substitute for the anarchist struggle for liberation, which involves adopting technology to our needs rather than rejecting it. The problem is that primitivists like to attack the very methods of mass organization that are necessary for overthrowing capitalism. Reasonable enough if you believe you have an alternative to anarchism, but rather damaging if all you have is an interesting critique. Other primitivists, however, take the Cassandra path, telling us that they are merely prophets of an inevitable doom. They don't desire the death of 5,900 million, they just point out it cannot be prevented. This is worth examining in some detail precisely because it is so disempowering. 
What, after all, is the use of fighting for a fair society today if tomorrow or the day after 98% of us are going to die and everything we have built crumble to dust? Are we all doomed? Primitivists are not the only ones to use the rhetoric of catastrophe to panic people into accepting their political proposals. Reformists such as George Monbiot use similar we are all doomed arguments to try and stampede people into support for reformism and world government. In the last decades, acceptance that the world is somehow doomed has become part of mainstream culture. First as the Cold War and then as looming environmental disaster. George Bush and Tony Blair created a panic over weapons of mass destruction to give cover to their invasion of Iraq. The need to examine and dismantle such panics is clear. The most convincing form the end of civilization panic takes is the idea of a looming resource crisis that will make life as we know it impossible. And the best resource to focus on, for those who wish to make this argument, is oil. Everything we produce, including food, is dependent on massive energy inputs, and 40% of the world's energy use is from oil. The primitivist version of this argument goes something like this. Everyone knows that in X number of years the oil will run out. This will mean civilization will grind to a halt, and this will mean lots of people will die. So we might as well embrace the inevitable. The oil running out argument is the primitivist equivalent of the orthodox Marxist final economic crisis that results in the overthrow of capitalism. And just like the orthodox Marxists, primitivists always argue this final crisis is always just around the corner. When looked at in any detail, this argument evaporates, and it becomes clear that neither capitalism nor civilization face a final crisis because of the oil running out. This is not because oil supplies are inexhaustible. Indeed, we may be reaching the peak of oil production today in 2004. But far from being the end of capitalism or civilization, this is an opportunity for profit and restructuring. Capitalism, however reluctantly, is gearing up to make profits out of developing alternative energy sources on the one hand, and on the other of accessing plentiful but more destructive to extract fossil fuel supplies. The second path, of course, makes global warming and other forms of pollution a lot worse, but that's not likely to stop the global capitalist class. It is not just primitivists who have become mesmerised by the oil crisis, so I intend to deal with this in a separate essay. But in summary, while oil will become more expensive over the decades, the process to develop substitutes for it is already underway. Denmark, for instance, intends to produce 50% of its energy needs from wind farms by 2030, and Danish companies are already making vast amounts of money because they are the leading producers of wind turbines. The switch over from oil is likely to provide an opportunity to make profits for capitalism rather than representing some form of final crisis. There may well be an energy crisis as oil starts to rise in price, and alternative technologies are not yet capable of filling this the 40% of energy This will cause oil and therefore energy prices to oil. soar, but this will be a crisis for the poor of the world, not for the wealthy, some of whom will even profit from it. A severe energy crisis could trigger a global economic downturn, but again, it is the world's workers that suffer the most in such times. There is a good argument that the world's elite are already preparing for such a situation. Many of the recent US wars make sense in terms of securing future oil supplies for US corporations. Capitalism is quite capable of surviving very destructive crises. World War II saw many of the major cities of Europe destroyed and most of the industry of Central Europe flattened. By bombers, by war, by retreating Germans and then torn up and shipped east by advancing Russians. Millions of European workers died as a result both in the war years and in the years that followed. But capitalism not only survived, it flourished as starvation allowed wages to be driven down and profits soared. What if? However, it is worth doing a little mental exercise on this idea of the oil running out. If indeed there was no alternative, what might happen? Would a primitivist utopia emerge, even at the bitter price of 5,900 million people dying? No. The primitivists seem to forget that we live in a class society. The population of the earth is divided into a few people with vast resources and power, and the rest of us. It is not a case of equal access to resources, rather of quite incredible unequal access.
Those who fell victim to the mass die-off would not include Rupert Murdoch, Bill Gates or George Bush because these people have the money and power to monopolise remaining supplies for themselves. Indeed, the first to die in huge number would be the population of the poorer megacities on the planet. Cairo and Alexandria in Egypt have a population of around 20 million between them. Egypt is dependent both on food imports and on the very intensive agriculture of the Nile Valley and the Oasis. Except for the tiny wealthy elite, those 20 million urban dwellers would have nowhere to go and there is no more land to be worked. Current high yields are in part dependent on high inputs of cheap energy. The mass deaths of millions of people is not something that destroys capitalism. Indeed, at periods of history, it has been seen as quite natural and even desirable for the modernisation of capital. The potato famine of the 1840s that reduced the population of Ireland by 30% was seen as desirable by many advocates of free trade. So was the 1943-44 famine in British rude Bengal, in which 4 million died. For the capitalist class, such mass deaths, particularly in colonies, afford opportunities to restructure the economy in ways that would otherwise be resisted. The real result of an end of energy crisis would see our rulers stockpiling what energy sources remained and using them to power the helicopter gunships that would be used to control those of us fortunate enough to be selected to toil for them in the biofuel fields. The unlucky majority would just be kept where they are and allowed to die off. More of the matrix than utopia in other words. The other point to be made here is that destruction can serve to regenerate capitalism. Like it or not, large-scale destruction allows some capitalists to make a lot of money. Think of the Iraq war. The destruction of the Iraqi infrastructure may be a disaster for the people of Iraq, but it's a profit-making bonanza for Halliburton and co. Not coincidentally, the Iraq war is helping the USA, where the largest corporations are based, gain control of the parts of the planet where much future and current oil production takes place. We can extend our intellectual exercise still further. Let us pretend that some anarchists are magically transported from the Earth to some Earth-like planet elsewhere. And we are dumped there without any technology at all. The few primitivists among us might head off to run with the deer, but a fair percentage would sit down and set about trying to create an anarchist civilization. Many of the skills we could bring might not be that useful. Programming without computers is of little use. But between us, we'd have a good basic knowledge of agriculture, engineering, hydraulics and physics. Next time the primitivists wandered through the area we settled, they'd find a landscape of farms and dams. We'd at least have wheeled carts and possibly draft animals if any of the large game were suitable for domestication. We'd send out parties looking for obvious sources of coal and iron, and if we found these, we'd mine and transport them. If not, we'd be felling a lot of lumber to turn it to charcoal to extract whatever iron or copper we could from what could be found. The furnace and the smelter would also be found on that landscape. We have some medical knowledge, most importantly an understanding of germs and medical hygiene, so we'd have both basic water purification and sewage removal systems. We'd understand the importance of knowledge, so we'd have an education system for our children and at least the beginnings of a long-term store of knowledge. Books. We could probably find the ingredients for gunpowder, which are quite common, which would give us the blasting technology need for large-scale mining and construction. If there was any marble nearby, we could make concrete, which is a much better building material than wood or mud. Technology did not come from the gods. It was not imposed on man by a mysterious outside force. Rather, it is something we developed and continue to develop. Even if you could turn the clock back, it would just start ticking again. John Zerzan seems to be the only primitivist capable of acknowledging this and he retreats to the position of seeing language and abstract thought as the problem. He is both right and ludicrous at the same time. His vision of utopia requires not only the death of the mass of the world's population but would require the genetically engineered lobotomy of those who survive in their offspring. Not of course something he advocates but a logical end point of his argument. Why argue against it? So why spend so much space demolishing such a fragile ideology as primitivism? One reason is the embarrassing connection with anarchism some primitivists seek to claim. More importantly, primitivism, both by implication and often in its cause, wants its followers to reject rationalism for mysticism and oneness with nature.
They are not the first irrational ecological movement to do so. A good third of the German Nazi party came from forest worshipping blood and soil movements that sprang up in Germany in the aftermath of World War I. This is not an empty danger. Within primitivism, a self-proclaimed irrational wing has developed that if not yet advocating Nazi-style death camps, has openly celebrated the deaths and murder of large numbers of people as a first step. In December 1997, the US publication Earth First wrote that, quote, The AIDS epidemic, rather than being a scourge, is a welcome development in the inevitable reduction of human population, end quote. Around the same time period in Britain, Steve Booth, one of the editors of a magazine called Green Anarchist, wrote that, quote, The Oklahoma bombers had the right idea. The pity was that they did not blast any more government offices. Even so, they did all they could, and now there are at least 200 government automatons that are no longer capable of oppression. The Tokyo Sarin cult had the right idea. The pity was that in testing the gas a year prior to the attack, they gave themselves away. They were not secretive enough. They had the technology to produce the gas, but the method of delivery was ineffective. One day, the groups will be totally secretive, and their methods of fumigation will be completely effective. End quote. This is where you end up when you celebrate spirituality over rationality. When the hope of running with deer overcomes the need to deal with the problem of making a revolution on a planet of 6 billion people. The ideas above have only reactionary conclusions. Their logic is elitist and hierarchical, little more than a semi-secular version of God's chosen people laying waste to the unbelievers. It certainly has nothing in common with anarchism. We need more, not less technology. Which brings us back to the start. Civilization comes with many, many problems, but it is better than the alternative. The challenge for anarchists is in transforming civilization to a form that is without hierarchy or imbalances of power or wealth. This is not a new challenge. It has always been the challenge of anarchism, as shown by the lengthy Bakunin quote at the start of this essay. To do this, we need modern technology to clean our water, pump away and process our waste, and inoculate or cure people of the diseases of high population density. With only 10 million people on the earth, you can shit in the woods, providing you keep moving on. With 6 billion people, those who shit in the woods are shitting in the water. They and those around them will have to drink. According to the UN, quote, each year more than 2.2 million people die from water and sanitation related diseases, many of them children, end quote. Close to 1 billion urban dwellers have no access to sustainable sanitation. Data for, quote, 43 African cities show that 83% of the population do not have toilets connected to sewers. The challenge then is not simply the construction of a civilization that keeps everyone's standard of living at the level they are now. The challenge is raising just about everyone's standard of living, but doing so in a manner that is reasonably sustainable. Only the further development of technology, coupled to a revolution that eliminates inequality across the planet, can deliver this. It is unfortunate that some anarchists who live in the most developed, most wealthy and most technological nations of the world prefer to play with primitivism rather than getting down to thinking about how we can really change the world. The global transformation required will make all previous revolutions fade into insignificance. The major problem is not simply that capitalism has been happy to leave a huge proportion of the world's population in poverty. The problem is also that development has been aimed at creating consumers for future products, rather than providing what people need. Transport provides the simplest example. A variety of forms of mass transport exist that can move huge numbers of people from place to place at great speed. Yet in the last decade, capitalism has concentrated on the form that uses the greatest resources per traveller, both in terms of what goes into making it and what is required to keep it running. This is the individual car. Across large areas of the most developed parts of the globe, this is pretty much the only way to get around in an efficient manner. The car has created the sprawling megacity, of which Los Angeles is perhaps the most infamous example. There, a city has been created whose urban layout makes individual car ownership almost compulsory. This form of transport is simply not a solution for most of the world's population. It's not simply that most people cannot afford a car at the moment. The resources consumed in the construction of the 3 billion odd cars needed for every adult inhabitant of the globe are simply not available. Nor are the resources, petrol, to run these 3 billion cars available. 
So taking hold of existing technologies and developing new ones cannot simply mean carrying on capitalist production or production methods under a red and black flag. Just as a future anarchist society would seek to abolish the boring, monotonous work of the assembly line, so it would need to radically change the nature of the products that are produced. At a simple level, in terms of transport, this would perhaps begin with greatly reducing the production of cars and greatly increasing the production of bicycles, motorbikes, trains, buses, trucks and minibuses. I'm neither a transport expert nor a worker in the transport industry, so I can do no more than guess at what these changes might be. But we should be aware that outside of the West, the need for transport is often solved in far less individualistic ways. Only the wealthy can afford a car, but the mass of the population can often move almost as quickly from one location to the other, making use of not only bus and rail, but also of systems of long-distance collective taxis and minibuses that run between towns whenever they are full. This is the challenge for anarchism, not simply to overthrow the existing capitalist world order, but also to see the birth of a new world. A world that is at least capable of delivering the same access to goods, transport, healthcare and education as is accessible to the middle class in Scandinavian countries today. It is that new society that will decide what new technologies are needed and how to adopt existing technologies to the challenge of the new world. It is quite likely that some technologies, if not discarded, will be very much downgraded. It's hard to believe we would happily decide to build new nuclear power stations for instance, Genetically modified organisms would need to prove something beyond the possibility of GMOs meaning greater profits and monopolies for corporations, not least that the benefit was greater than the dangers. As long as capitalism exists, it will continue to wreak environmental havoc as it chases profits. It will only effectively respond to the energy crisis once that becomes profitable, and because there will be a lag of many years before oil can be replaced, This might mean worsening poverty and death for many of the poorer people in the world. But we cannot fix these problems by dreaming of some lost golden age when the world's population was low enough to support hunter-gathering. We can only sort it out by building the sort of mass movements that can not only overthrow capitalism but also introduce a libertarian society. And on the way, we need to find ways to halt and even reverse some of the worst of the environmental threats capitalism is generating. Primitivism is a pipe dream. It offers no way forward in the struggle for a free society. Often its adherents end up undermining that struggle by attacking the very things, like mass organisation, that are a requirement to win it. Those primitivists who are serious about changing the world need to re-examine what they are fighting for. That was Civilization, Primitivism and Anarchism by Andrew Flood. Up next is, is primitivism realistic? An anarchist reply to John Zerzan and others. Just a reminder that a link to both text versions is in the description, as well as a link to a relevant article on peak oil. So let's move on. Here's the second reading. Is primitivism realistic? An anarchist reply to John Zerzan and others. Last year I published the article Civilization, Primitivism and Anarchism to sketch out what I saw as the glaring contradictions in primitivism and where it clashed with anarchism. Primitivism, I argued, was an absurdity that could never happen without the removal of the vast majority of the world's population. And far from being related to anarchism, it was in contradiction with the basic tenet of anarchism, the possibility of having a free mass society without a state. The article has circulated on and offline over the year and sparked numerous discussions. A number of primitivists, including John Zerzan, have replied directly to it and others have published what appear to be indirect replies. Here I want to answer the direct replies and in doing so expand the critique of primitivism. The original essay was also using primitivism as a stalking horse to address what I see as one of the major problems in anarchism as it appears in the English speaking world. That is, a large-scale failure to take itself seriously. So-called anarcho-primitivism is the most obvious example, but sections of the actual anarchist movement have also constructed a set of ideological positions that almost seem designed to make successful mass work impossible. Large sections of the anarchist movement seem to have forgotten that the goal of anarchism is to change the world, not simply to provide a critique of the left or be a minor thorn in the side of the state. Is primitivism realistic? (laughs) 
This reply continues in the same vein. On the surface it is about primitivism, but you don't have to dig that deep to see that some of the criticisms can be applied in a more general sense. A good place to start in that context is with the poster calling themselves Aragon, who posted on more than one of the sites that carried the original article. In a comment on anarchistnews.org, Aragon states that Flood, quote, seems to focus his critique on what he calls the question of whether primitivism provides any sort of realistic alternative, which always seems like a bizarre metric for an anarchist to use as a measurement, end quote. This is the statement that inspired the title of the essay. Here we have someone who openly proclaims it to be bizarre to even ask if primitivism provides a realistic alternative to capitalism. Far from being a refutation to the original essay, this reinforces the central point of it. That there is no way the advocates of primitivism could take the idea seriously if they thought its consequences through. A lot of primitivism theory strikes me as the work of those who like playing with ideas but really have no idea how these ideas could be implemented. As with Aragon, who finds the idea of implementation of their own ideas bizarre. But this is also a problem in the anarchist movement. All too often plans are drawn up or slogans trotted out without asking if they are realistic. Can they actually achieve what they claim to be about? The only test that appears to be used is whether the plan is pure enough. What sort of test is this for anything except perhaps for a religious sect? The core issue. Generally responses to the essay from primitivists were often a lot more constructive than what I expected. I expected to get mostly abuse, and I did, but a few did attempt to address the arguments. However, there was no real attempt to address the core point of my original article, which was that the population question made a joke out of any claim by primitivism to be anything beyond a critique of the world. This is unsurprising. As far as I can tell, there is no answer to the very obvious problem that emerges when you compare the number of people living on the planet, 6 billion plus, and the optimistic maximum of 100 million, 2% of this that the planet might be able to support if civilization was abandoned for a return to hunter-gatherer existence. I'll summarise my argument from the previous essay. Primitivism generally argues that the development of agriculture was where it all went wrong. It therefore implies we should return to pre-agricultural methods of getting food, that is hunter-gathering. But agriculture allows us to get vastly greater quantities of food from a given area. Estimates can be made of how many people could live on the planet as hunter-gatherers based on the amount of food that would be available to them. These estimates suggest a maximum population of around 100 million. This is what is called an elephant in the living room argument. The question of what would happen to the other 5,900 million people is so dominant that it makes discussion of the various other claims made by primitivism seem a waste of time until the population question is answered. Yet the only attempts at a response showed a rather touching faith in technology and civilization. Quite a surprise. This response can be summarized as that such population reductions can happen slowly over time because people can be convinced to have fewer or even no children. There is no attempted at explanation for how convincing 6 billion people of the earth to have no children might go ahead. Programs that advocate lower numbers of children are hardly a new idea. They have already been implemented both nationally and globally without much success. China's infamous one-child program includes a high degree of compulsion, but has not even resulted in a population decrease. China's population is forecast to grow by 100 to 250 million by 2025. An explanation of how primitivists hope to achieve by persuasion what others have already failed to do by compulsion is needed, yet no such attempt to even sketch this out exists. As if this was not difficult enough for primitivists, the implications of other arguments they make turn an impossible task into an even more impossible task. For primitivists, arguments normally include the idea that civilization is about to create a major crisis that will either end or come close to ending life on the planet. Whether caused by peak oil, global warming or another side effect of technology, we are told this crisis is at best a few decades away. Even if primitivists could magically convince the entire population of the planet to have few or no children, this process could only reduce the population over generations. But if a crisis is only decades away, there is no time for this strategy. For even if 90% of the population was to be magically convinced tomorrow, it would still take decades for the population to reduce to the 100 million or less that could be supported by hunter-gathering. 
and in the real world, there is no mechanism for magically convincing people of any argument, not least one that requires them to ignore what many people find to be a fundamental biological drive to have children. Some of the older primitivists I know even have children themselves. If they can't convince themselves, then why do they think they can convince everyone else? The contradiction between these two positions is so obvious that I can only conclude that those primitivists who have put forward this convince everyone to have fewer babies position have only done so in order to shore up their faith. It is an argument invented to try and hide the elephant in the room, but really it only hides it from themselves. It is impossible to see how they could expect anyone else to find a convincing answer to the population question. Zerzan's reply John Zerzan's reply to my essay included a variation of this defense of primitivism. Quote, it could also be noted that population is hardly a given. It seems to be more an effect than a cause. For instance, an effect of domestication aboriginal, Latin for from the beginning from the source, if we are talking about civilization. And so it seems to me likely that the numbers might come down fairly quickly were we to move away from domestication. I do not know anyone who says this could happen overnight. Flood to the contrary. Well, first off, population is a given. I'm not imagining that there are 6 billion people on the earth. There are 6 billion people plus on the planet. We cannot simply wish that there were 100 million. There are 6 billion and this is a figure that is forecast to rise. Whatever about the forces that drove the development of agriculture 12,000 years ago, where there is debate about cause and effect, the reality is that stopping the cultivation of all domestic plants and animals would result in the death by starvation of 5.9 billion people. So yes, a move away from domestication would indeed mean that, quote, numbers might come down fairly quickly. Starvation only takes a few months. Zerzan is also misquoting me. I never claimed that some primitivists said civilization had to go overnight. One can see why Zerza needed to invent this particular red herring. Like other primitivists, he believes that time is running out. In an interview with fellow primitivist academic Jarek Jensen, Zerza himself said, quote, In a few decades, there won't be much left to fight for, especially when you consider the acceleration of environmental degradation and personal dehumanization. End quote. Again, I'll point out, if we only have a few decades, this is hardly the time span in which a voluntary reduction of the Earth's population by some 98% could occur. In particular, as the Earth's population is actually forecast to rise to perhaps as much as 10 billion in that time. The evasive language Zerzan uses in his response to me is typical of the primitivist approach to the population question, and although he might throw out the red herring that, quote, I do not know anyone else who says this could happen overnight, in the original essay I actually quoted some primitivists who either saw the collapse of civilization as a short-term inevitability, or who worse, like Derek Jensen, wanted to bring it on. As I pointed out in the original article, Jensen is on record as writing, quote, I want civilization brought down, and I want it brought down now. In fact, since my article was published, he has taken this further with a call for concrete action, quote, We need people to take out dams, and we need people to knock out electrical infrastructures. So while Zerzan may be smart enough to be evasive on this, not all of his followers are. And while Zerzan may have forgotten Jensen, he does know him. At least he was interviewed by him in 2000, and the 10,000 word interview that was published, which would suggest that they have at least spent some hours in each other's company. Zerzan, like other primitivists, continues to evade the logic of his own position. It's all very well to talk of a gradual population reduction, but just how does he think primitivists are going to achieve a population reduction from 6 billion to 0 0.1 billion in a few decades? What would be gradual about this? This would require a ban on all but 2% of the Earth's population having any children at all. The ball is really in Zerzan's court. He needs to demonstrate a mechanism for a non-compulsory and rapid reduction in population that would require the vast majority of the Earth's population to be happy to have no children at all. He needs to explain how he can even explain this message to all of the people in the world, never mind convince them of it and Zerzan needs a voluntary mechanism of ensuring that those he fails to convince do not undermine this reduction, for instance religious or other minorities who disagree with the primitivists and choose to have many children. And all this has to happen within his own deadline of a few decades, 
With this sort of burden of proof, it is easy to see why primitivists are not so keen on demonstrating that they have a realistic alternative. The nasty side. Those not blinded by ideology looking at this burden of proof will conclude either that primitivism is of no practical use, or that those primitivists who are rational and still hold to primitivism have some program they are not revealing. Quite clearly, some of those who see themselves as primitivists do favour die-offs or advocate policies that would make them inevitable. Jensen's call for people to take out dams to knock out electrical infrastructures would result in large numbers of deaths if any number of people were to take him seriously. It's just a toned-down version of Steve Booth's lauding of the Tokyo Sarin attacks and Booth's fantasy in Green Anarchist that, quote, One day the groups will be totally secretive and their methods of fumigation will be completely effective. These sorts of murderous anti-human sentiments are not only tolerated within primitivism, but their authors are promoted. You'll find their essays uncritically reproduced all over the web and in various print publications. My previous essay produced howls of outrage because I pointed out the existence of such writings. But the problem here is not that I point out their existence, it is that the primitivists ignore them until it is pointed out. Yet they work with these people, they publish these people, and then they scuffle around with embarrassment and cry unfair when what they say is pointed out. And it is not just the primitivists, even sections of the anarchist movement in the name of maintaining a broad church uncritically publish Jensen and invite him to address meetings. This is quite astounding given the consequences of what he's advocating. I can only presume he is tolerated in some anarchist circles because of the general confusion that equates militant tactics with militant politics, forgetting that elements of the far right can also use militant tactics. There is no critique of the die-off point of view from those who call themselves anarcho-primitivists. Zerzan is happy to do a lengthy interview with someone who says he wants, quote, civilization brought down now, and I want it brought down now, without even bringing the consequences of such a position up with them. If he wanted to distance himself from Jensen, he has already had the opportunity to do so. The Centrality of the Agricultural Revolution Elsewhere, Zerzan has written of the development of agriculture that, quote, the debasing of life in all spheres, now proceeding at a quickening pace, stems from the dynamics of civilization itself. Domestication of animals and plants, a process only 10,000 years old, has penetrated every square inch of the planet. The result is the elimination of individual and community autonomy and health, as well as the rampant accelerating destruction of the natural world." End quote. This is relevant because a number of people who replied objected to me choosing the development of agriculture as the point at which civilization can be said to have developed. But as the original essay explained, quote, Of course civilization is a rather general term. For the purposes of this article, I'm taking as a starting point that the form of future society that primitivists argue for would be broadly similar in technological terms to that which existed around 12,000 years ago on Earth, at the dawn of the agricultural revolution. End quote. I could have picked an older date, the first cave paintings for instance, but this would not only have been more arbitrary, but it would have presented an even greater population problem for the primitivists. I could have picked a more recent date, but this would hardly have helped the primitivists, as they then would have had to include many of the features of civilization, including the state, in their primitive utopia. And, as our ability to support a large population has escalated sharply in recent years, even a primitive society that aimed only to return to, say, 1800, would still have to get rid of the majority of the Earth's population. Evasion aside, it is quite clear that from the primitive's point of view, it was the agricultural revolution and the changes that happened alongside this where things went bad. For understandable reasons, not wanting to deal with the population question, primitivists and their fellow travellers tend to avoid any date even as general as the agricultural revolution. But it's the one I choose to work with, and this appears to be fair enough with those primitivists more willing to openly argue their position. Agriculture also seems a very logical starting point, because agriculture is what makes a mass society possible. Hunter-gatherers can't gather in large groups for a long period because they exhaust local food sources. Nor do small groups of hunter-gatherers generally have the surplus food required to develop a high degree of specialisation of labour, and any specialisation is a bad thing, according to most primitivists. 
I also think it's hard to construct a coherent primitivism that does not exclude agriculture, since the dawn of agriculture and class society seem to occur together. This fact has been understood on the left, at least as far back as Engels, the origin of the family private property in the state, and I'll discuss its implications next. But in terms of the overall argument about food production, this is a side argument. The Earth's current population requires the agricultural technology of the last hundred odd years. Going back to primitive agriculture is not much more of an option than going back to hunter-gathering. It would still leave billions of people facing death by starvation. Is primitivism a branch of anarchism? It is true that agriculture is required before the surplus is generated on which a state structure can be built. This is about the only argument the primitivists have. The state has always been a feature of civilization. The challenge for those of us who want to abolish the state, and this has always been understood as a central challenge of anarchism from the 1860s, is to create a civilization that does not have the mechanisms of state repression that all civilizations to date have had. This brings me on to another issue that upset some of those who wrote replies to my essay. T. Politics, quote, Primitivism isn't in itself a critique of anarchism at all, it is a supplement to anarchism, is the best developed expression of this sort of reply. T. Politic goes on to assert that, quote, Civilization, and for some technology, agriculture, language, and other products of human society, is not compatible with ecological sustainability, and that the persistence of civilization, whether feudal, capitalist, socialist, or anarchist, would lead to the eventual destruction of the life sustaining qualities of this planet. I think the case for primitivism being a break with rather than a development of anarchism is very clear. I outlined this at some length in my original article. The primitivist argument is essentially identical to the liberal argument for why the state is necessary. The state, they claim, is what allows mass society to exist. Without the state, we would have the war of all against all. The primitivists agree, but as they are anti-state, they are therefore required, also, to be anti-mass society. Yet the origins of anarchism lie in a movement that sought to go beyond the seeming contradiction, a movement built on the idea that you could have a free society without the state. This was the ideological cornerstone on which anarchism was founded. Bakunin, for instance, writing on Rousseau's theory of the state, wrote in words that are as applicable to the core argument of primitivism as they were at the time to liberalism, that, quote, According to the theory, primitive men enjoying absolute liberty only in isolation are antisocial by nature. When forced to associate, they destroy each other's freedom. If this struggle is unchecked, it can lead to mutual extermination. But for anarchists, quote, It is now proven that no state could exist without committing crimes, or at least without contemplating and planning them. Even when its impotence should prevent it from perpetrating crimes, we today conclude in favour of the absolute need of destroying states. Or, if it is so decided, their radical and complete transformation, so that ceasing to be power centralised and organised from the top down, by violence or by authority of some principle, they may recognise with absolute liberty for the parties to unite or not to unite, and with liberty for each of these always to leave a union, even when freely entered into, from the bottom up, according to the real needs and the natural tendencies of the parties through the free federation of individuals, associations, communes, districts, provinces and nations within humanity." End quote. Bakunin's argument is that liberals insist that large numbers of people cannot live together without a state to supervise them as they would come into conflict with each other. But anarchists insist that large numbers of people can come together and preserve their freedom through a range of bottom-up organising methods. Mass society and freedom are possible. This is something primitivists deny. In a similar vein, Kropotkin wrote, quote, Recent evolution has prepared the way for showing the necessity and possibility of a higher form of social organisation that may guarantee economic freedom without reducing the individual to the role of a slave to the state. The origins of government have been carefully studied and all metaphysical conceptions as to its divine or social contract derivation having been laid aside, it appears that it is among us of a relatively modern origin and that its powers have grown precisely in proportion as a division of society into the privileged and unprivileged classes that was growing in the course of ages. Here Kropotkin is arguing that humanity can create forms of mass organisation that do not require the state and which can create economic freedom. 
And while the Liberals may argue that the state is required for the existence of mass society, this seems to be a recent argument invented to justify the division of society into classes. As can be seen, from the beginning, anarchism has included a rejection of the core idea of primitivism, that there is an irreconcilable contradiction between mass society and liberty. It has sought alternative ways to organise mass society that eliminate the role of the state. For these, quote, free federation of individuals, associations, communes, districts, provinces and nations within humanity, are all features of mass society. In the 1860s, the argument that there was such an irreconcilable contradiction was an anti-anarchist argument, one that the anarchists took time to refute. To try and incorporate the same argument into anarchism today is to make nonsense of the term anarchism. For some reason, there is a very strong tendency in the USA for the emergence of ideologies which use the label anarchist, but which are in reality at odds with anarchism. There have been at least three such streams in the last two decades. Anarcho-capitalism, post-leftism and anarcho-primitivism. All three have used a similar methodology of trying to relabel anarchism as left anarchism or sometimes red anarchism. All three have shared the same ideological anti-communist rugged individualism by which all forms of collective mass organisation can only be authoritarian. It is hard not to write this off as simply a radical reflection of the state ideology of the USA. In the case of primitivism, it also accepts George Bush's claim that USA society has to have the car culture. For Bush, this means the USA has to sacrifice the environment in order to maintain its current standard of living. Primitivism accepts the first claim, but unlike Bush, rejects the price as too great to carry. So primitivism seeks the end of civilization itself. Like Bush, it also seems unwilling to admit that elsewhere on the planet, people already organise their lives in ways that have a much lower energy demand. Even Western Europe, which is a similar standard of living to the USA, has per person a use of energy half that of the USA. Technology The technology question causes a huge amount of confusion with primitivists, mixing up a particular form or consequence of technology with the technology itself. I had tried to deal with this in the original essay using the example of motorised transport, yet some replies were from people in the USA who couldn't get their heads around the idea of the technology of motorised transport being used in any other way than the way it is used in the USA. There it is perhaps more reasonable for someone to believe that car culture could not likely be eliminated without destroying civilization. US culture and urban geography means that right now there are huge areas of the country where only a car is pretty essential to survival. But this isn't typical of the rest of the world, not even parts of the US. If you lived in Manhattan for instance, for day to day life a car is more of a problem than a requirement. People across huge areas of the planet have a very low percentage of car ownership, in the most part because people are too poor to afford individual cars. Yet those with money still have access to mass transportation. If you go anywhere in North Africa, you can travel long distances rapidly and at ease, reaching even quite small towns because the lack of individual car ownership has created a market for an incredibly sophisticated network of collective taxis. They leave from fixed points in each town whenever a vehicle is full. Really busy routes also have trains and buses. The point is that even under capitalism, alternative ways of dealing with the need for transportation already exist. There is nothing inevitable about the car culture that is a feature of how the technology of the internal combustion engine has been used in the USA. Some of the replies focused on my treatment of technology and in particular the contention that the only way out of the population crisis is both more technology and more access to technology. Unsurprisingly, as I used the peak oil theory in the original essay, this resulted in discussion on some sites dedicated to discussing peak oil. Omar, for instance, thought this means I, quote, argue technology as the saviour. Others even thought this meant I was in favour of atomic weapons. These misunderstandings are probably my fault for stating the case too crudely in the original. It is worth deepening the discussion. My position is that the combination of modern capitalism and the way it uses technology has given us an unstable and unsustainable economic system that only even attempts to address the interests of a small minority of the planet's population. And although I may not believe the end is nigh, I do accept that things cannot go on as they are without major problems. Of course, being an anarchist, I already want to overthrow capitalism and see the economy restructured from top to bottom. 
so saying things cannot continue as they are presents me with no difficulties. However, unlike some peak oil enthusiasts and all primitivists, I am not willing to argue that we need to go back to some simpler time when less energy inputs were required because that would involve accepting the removal of billions of people from the planet. A social revolution that not only introduces new technology but remodels what already exists is the only logical way forward. In that context, technology is what we do with it. In the general sense, it is neither liberatory nor repressive. Particular applications of technology may be either. A rifle in the hands of a US Marine is different in that sense from a rifle in the hands of a Zapatista. The birth control pill certainly plays a part in giving women choices about reproduction that were previously hard to come by safely. It also allows her to control her fertility without the cooperation of her partner. On the other hand, it is impossible to think of a positive use of the electric chair or a nuclear bomb. It is also true that the development of technology made it possible to have a society where there was a division into workers and bosses. Once you can store a surplus of food, for instance, you can have accumulation of meaningful wealth and so the ability to pay the soldier, the policeman and the executioner. So the question comes down to whether it's possible to have a free technological society. And anarchism insists it is, or whether the choice is between a primitive freedom or an oppressive technological society. The vast majority of political theories, perhaps all except anarchism, do indeed claim you cannot have a free technological society. I think it is worth hoping that they are wrong even if we have never as yet had such a society. That a free technological society is possible is, as I have argued, the central point of anarchism. Some of the other stuff. The replies also included areas that in my view are of much lesser importance. Amongst those are responses from some who attempt to blend primitivism into vegetarian or even veganism. This really only serves to underline how some primitivists have not really given any serious thought to what they advocate at all. Very few ecosystems could support vegan humans attempting to live off the land without agriculture. As far as I'm aware, all primitive societies that exist today on the planet carry out hunting as well as gathering. In this context, I am indeed a quote, damn speciesist, who doesn't have a problem with humans, quote, exploiting the land for your own good, taking away vital habitat and feeding ground. Ecological diversity should be preserved because it is in our ability to do so and doing so will be good for us rather than because we prefer trees to people or because otherwise the earth will be upset. All actually existing so-called primitive peoples are speciesist. They hunt animals. The luxury of some people choosing not to eat meat at all is a feature of civilization. Abstract or symbolic, who cares? I'll also deal with the remainder of Zerzan's reply to my original essay here as he is the leading light of anarcho-primitivism and I'd hate people to think I was avoiding part of his argument. The remainder of his reply reads, quote, Flood probably knows that nowhere I have rejected abstract thought but it better serves his weak assault on primitivism to say otherwise. Some of our ancestors were cooking with fire 2 million years ago, travelling on the open seas 800,000 years ago. And yet the evidence for symbolic culture hardly goes back 40,000 years. Thus, it would seem, there was intelligence that preceded what we think of as symbolic. Possibly a more direct kind in keeping with a more direct connection with the natural world. Well, this is a long topic that I won't try to rehash here. One that doesn't quite fit Flood's soundbite characterization. This section appears to be a reply to where I was explaining my methodology in choosing agriculture as representing the start of civilization. I'd actually mentioned Zerzan only twice in the original article. Why might I have thought Zerzan rejected abstract thought? Well, partly because I had presumed symbolic thought and abstract thought pretty much amounted to the same thing. But in any case, Zerzan has also appeared to specifically attack abstract thought. In his essay on Number, Its Origin and Evolution, he writes, quote, Math is the paradigm of abstract thought, and then, quote, Mathematics is reified, ritualized thought, the virtual abandonment of thinking. To me, this, and similar sentiments along the same lines elsewhere in the essay, sound a lot like a rejection of abstract thought. In his reply, he also seems keen to tell me you can have intelligence without symbolic culture. I can only agree. Geese, for instance, manage to migrate large distances, but don't, as far as I'm aware, produce any art. But he may be wrong that evidence for symbolic culture in humans only goes back 40,000 years. 
Ian Watts of University College London claims red ochre and other red pigments were being used at least 100 and 120,000 years ago, and that, quote, new findings in Zambia and the redating of the important border cave site in South Africa push the date of the earliest use back further still perhaps to 170,000 years ago in Zambia. Given that the, quote, oldest fossil evidence for anatomically modern humans is about 130,000 years old, end quote, this would suggest symbolic culture or symbolic thought is as old as Homo sapiens. Anyway, to be honest, I'm all for abstract thought. I like the ability to read a text, to think about its contents, and perhaps then to argue against it. This ability is what is needed to create freedom. It has been at the centre of all modern revolutionary processes. Even if we could, why would we want to give up the ability to think abstractly? Class conflict? Tea politic and other commentators take issue with me pointing out that even if a major environmental crisis resulted in large-scale death and destruction, this would not necessarily mean the end of capitalism. Tea politic asserts that, quote, a tiny wealthy elite could not possibly continue to control vast natural resources in the event of collapse. When one elite can no longer hold a carrot in front of thousands of poor, those poor will revolt, end quote. This assertion is wishful thinking for two reasons, not least that the ruling class has seldom maintained power through dangling the carrot alone. Firstly, it presumes that the crisis will somehow creep up on the ruling class, that they will be unable to react or prepare for it. Capitalism is very much more adaptable than this. For example, there has been a huge amount of research on alternative energy sources over the last few years, as some capitalists anticipate making a substantial profit out of peak oil. On flicking through a recent issue of The Economist magazine, which is close to being a bible for many CEOs, I noticed that six out of the dozen or so glossy full page ads were to do with alternatives to oil or energy saving technologies like hybrid cars. The transnational corporation BP, British Petroleum, Amoco, rebranded itself Beyond Petroleum back in the year 2000. Although this was rightly seen as an attempt to greenwash it, it was also to manoeuvre itself for the new energy markets that would open up as oil declined. On a more local scale, the large-scale destruction from Hurricane Katrina is actually being used by capitalism to restructure parts of the New Orleans economy in their interests. Anarcho has written that Bush's plans for New Orleans amounts to a, quote, blank sheet upon which the far right will unleash their plans for social engineering. Children will go to school with vouchers, wages will be lowered and regulations waived to accommodate the bosses. The entire area will become a free enterprise zone. A flat tax will be imposed, all under the guise of economic revival premised on the belief that corporations freed from trade unions, workers' rights, environmental restrictions and taxes will reap huge profits and those profits will grow the pie for everybody. This is the way that capitalism works. Crises are opportunities for new investment for those companies in favour, e.g. Halliburton in Iraq, and excuses to impose cuts on the working class, e.g. the introduction of the bin tax in Dublin. Mass death and destruction have often been a central part of the development of capitalism, not a threat to it. For capitalism, they can be opportunities to remove unproductive people from the land, e.g. the Irish famine of the 1840s. Much of the original wealth on which capitalism was founded was part and parcel of the process that almost entirely wiped out the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Today, tens of millions of people die every year from diseases that are easily preventable. There is also nothing automatic about poverty or a decline in living standards being met with mass revolt. Capitalism, and the market in particular, is also an inbuilt mechanism through which the population are encouraged to accept the hoarding of scarce resources as natural, in the West today, this means the rich have access to fast cars, luxury homes and private yachts. Not that much of a hardship for the rest of us. But elsewhere in the world, the rich have access to these things while the poor literally starve in the streets. If there was to be a real crisis in world food production, then this is what would visit the working class in the USA and beyond. To a minor extent, this is what happened in Depression-era America and in post-war Europe. In neither case did it lead to significant revolts, never mind the collapse of civilization. The second reason why a major crisis would not automatically lead to the fall of capitalism is more brutal. The need to spell it out simply reflects the rather naive thinking of a lot of primitivists when it comes to the ruthless nature of capitalism. 
Jay Gould, the US financier and railroad businessman, summed up this nature when he said, quote, I can hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. Outside of a recent brief period in Western Europe and the USA, capitalism has routinely deployed enormous repressive forces to defeat rebellion. In the 1970s, it created military dictatorships, which killed tens of thousands of people across South America. In Central America, in the 1980s, it killed hundreds of thousands. There have been moments in history when the ruling class was at least briefly defeated. The Russian and Spanish revolutions being the most common examples. But this was not a simple product of desperation. If desperation led to revolution, then revolution would have swept the African ruling class away years ago. It was also a product of revolutionary organisation, stretching over decades, and a set of revolutionary ideas that could unite people in the struggle for a better world. Large-scale crisis can indeed bring about large-scale upheavals, but without a positive revolutionary programme that unites people, such upheavals always end up with a new faction of the ruling class in the driving seat. In fact, capitalism and the ruling class are so flexible that they can undergo apparent defeat only to end up back in control in a new form within years, as happened in Russia after 1917. So yes, unless we are organised on a mass scale, a tiny wealthy elite will indeed continue to control vast natural resources in the event of collapse. They have hundreds of years of experience of doing just that. And they won't just use the much depleted carrot to do so, they also have the stick, and for much of world history, it is the stick, rather than the carrot, that has had their lead role in keeping people in line. Technological developments mean one man in a helicopter can provide the same level of stick that previously an army of hundreds was required for. They can still hire one half of the working class to kill the other half, but in repression, as with other areas these days, they are able to downsize. Hope for the future Primitivism offers no hope and no programme for a revolutionary change of society. It includes some of the most reactionary and anti-human writings this side of fascism. I've even read primitivists writing off the death of the mass of the world's population on the grounds that, quote, quite a few of those 5.9 billion are just empty shells. But even the best of the writings offer no more than some interesting ideas to ponder over. Ideas that have been around for the last 200 years. There are real problems associated with the growth of the human population and the wasteful nature of capitalism. We are already seeing the emergence of long-term environmental problems even if the end is not yet nigh. But as bad as the effects on the environment are, the real shame is that we live in a planet where millions starve in order that a tiny ruling class can live in absolute luxury. Anarchism offers an alternative to the capitalist system, an alternative that can provide a decent life for everyone on the planet, both in terms of material good and control over their own lives. But achieving this alternative is not a question for waiting for people to rise up. It is a question of organising the vast majority of the planet against the tiny elite who rule us. Anarchist communism provides the best hope for freedom and the best model for fighting for freedom. It distills the lessons of hundreds of years of struggle and of all the successes and failings of these struggles. It does not have the answer. That is something that can only be created by the self-managed struggle of the mass of the population of this planet. Our role is to help the emergence of this struggle. That's been another Worker Solidarity Movement podcast. Thank you for listening. There's plenty more where that came from. If you like the sound of a society which is at once large scale, technologically advanced and truly free, then make sure to click the link in the description and visit the WSM website at www.wsm.ie. Take care and see you next time. Another world is possible.